Yeah. Dissolving means like to be eliminated pretty much. Oh, so if I take like sugar, put it in water, it's going to dissolve. That means there's no more sugar? Well, you don't see the sugar anymore. Ah, okay. So there's a physical change that happens. It goes from being a solid to being something else. That's, that's definitely true. So um, dissolution means dissolving. Um, so sugar is one example of how things can dissolve. What about when things don't dissolve? What would you see then? Right, I'm writing that it disappears, but I just mean that in terms of like what Matt said, it visually it disappears. It doesn't like cease to exist because we know that matter is conserved. Chat, chat, chat. Oh, it might precipitate. Yeah, so if something does not dissolve, um, so we would call that um, insoluble, right? You'll have a heterogeneous mixture of that because you'll have the precipitate, the plus the, the water or whatever liquid you're dissolving with, right? So you'll have a heterogeneous mixture. Cool. And then the third option, um, the third option is called ionization. Does anybody know what that means? Oh, deposits. Oh, that's a good question. So no, um, deposits are not the same as what you'll see here when um, something is not soluble. Deposits are going to form on an object, like a metal strip in the lab, for example. Here, when we're talking about dissolving, we're not putting usually metal strips in there to react. That would be a chemical change. Technically, dissolving things is not a chemical change. It's physical. Um, because I can get them back just by like, if I have sugar water, I just boil the water off, right? And then I have sugar again, as long as I don't burn it. If you burn it, that's a chemical change because it's different chemistry. So ionization, what do you think it has to do with ionization? Let's circle it. It does, so yeah, it does have something to do with ions, right? Um, things that are ionic are going to ionize. Um, so let me give you an example of that, right? If I take sodium chloride as a solid and I put it into water, I'm gonna get the ions surrounded by water. We call that hydrated by water, like that. Oop, can't lay on the chat. So ionic things will do that when they dissolve. Covalent things like sugar. Oh, I just had my phone. That was weird. Covalent things like sugar don't ionize. They just do this. They just say, they just stay the way they are. Oh, whoops. But they become AQ instead of solid. So we're not changing their structures whatsoever. We're just changing the phase, essentially. Um, things that don't dissolve, of course, will just stay solid. Um, these are both homogeneous mixtures. When they do dissolve, you're going to get a homogeneous mixture. So that's the connection with chapter one. Um, so they'll look very similar. You can't really tell the difference between a salt water solution and a sugar water solution. How would you, how would you figure out the difference? I handed you a cup and said, tell me what's in there. How would you do it? Well, you could taste it, but I don't think that's allowed. It's not allowed in the chem lab. That's true. Do not taste anything in the chem lab. It's a bad idea. But actually, that is how, how chemists used to do it, to be honest with you. It, even as far back as like the 70s, early 80s, before we knew how dangerous um, how dangerous it was to do that, people would first characterize stuff based on how it tastes. So if it tasted salty, it was a salt. If it tasted sweet, then it falls into the sugar category. Um, other things besides ionic substances that ionize include acids and bases. So we do have to kind of have an idea of how to tell if things are an acid. That comes from our naming chapter. And also be on the lookout for the things that are bases, okay? 
Um, does anyone know how acids taste? We eat them quite frequently. They sour. Sour, yeah. So, so citric acid is what is on like Sour Patch Kids on the outside of it to make it sour. Anyone know how bases taste? Uh, better, better. Yeah. Plants use basic compounds quite a lot in um, like the outside layers to protect the fruit. So, for example, uh, an orange. The inside is very sweet, has a lot of sugar, a little bit of acid. We like to eat that. The white part between the peel and the fruit is called the pith, and the pith is really bitter. That's why we peel all that white stuff off. You don't want to eat it. It's gross. That's because if a bug is trying to get into the fruit, most of the time they stop at the white layer and they never get into the fruit where the seeds grow up. All right, so bases are generally not tasty, not very good. Um, some of the vegetables we don't like are quite bitter. So, um, oh, fun fact. You uh, uh, humans in general have a lot of taste buds that receive, they have receptors that are sensitive to base compounds because most of the time bases are poison. Um, but this is why kids don't like uh, broccoli and asparagus and Brussels sprouts because there's a lot of, there's a relatively high amount of alkaline, alkaline means base by the way. There's a relatively high amount of alkaline compounds in vegetables. They're not toxic to us, but um, kids have a lot of taste receptors for bases because they're usually poisonous and little bodies are easier to poison with a small amount of uh, food that they can ingest. So it's actually a reflex when they taste something bitter to spit it out which is hilarious. If you've never fed a toddler, you should try it. All right, so these are, our, these are the three possible categories where the sugar stays, you know, all covalent compounds do this except acids and bases, but they'll stay the same, just become aqueous instead of solid. Electrolytes, this is the, if you watched the video on electrolytes, maybe you remember that, but these three categories, ionic compounds, acids and bases are electrolytes, and they will ionize whenever you put them in the water. And the third category, of course, is that it doesn't dissolve. All right, so then if we can just determine whether something is an electrolyte or not, soluble or not, we can make a determination about what species, what chemicals are going to be present in our mixture. So if we take iron 2 bromide and we mix it with water, the question is what kind of compound is that? So ionic or covalent. Just cover the veggies with butter. Uh, actually, that does work. Fat solubilizes some of the, well, I'm not going to, that's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interesting cooking chemistry. Let's stop with that. Salt also helps, but anyways. All right, we got a bunch of people saying ionic. So this one is ionic, which means it's going to ionize. All right, and so now in order to answer this question, we have to figure out what it will ionize into. Oops, hold on. Is a solid. All right, so we're gonna ionize this. What is it gonna What is it gonna break up into? So we have NaCl as an example. You know why coffee is bitter? Because it's delicious. That's why. So let's use the NaCl as an example. When we have the ionic compound NaCl, it breaks up into the, the cation Na and the anion Cl. So over here we have the compound FeBr2. Which one's the cation? Fe. Yeah, so it's a positive one. Can anybody tell me which version of iron this is going to be? Is it going to be a plus two or a plus three? Plus two. Yeah, how'd you get that? Exactly. How'd you guys figure that out? The subscript on the BR. Yeah. So BR is always a minus one, and we have two of those. So that's perfect. Okay. No, oh, and BR is minus one. Perfect. Good. Thank you. How many total BR do we have on the left? <laughs> so, 
Thank you for pointing that out. It does say iron two right there as well. It's true. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. So we have two bromine on the left because we have a subscript of two, but right now I've only got one. So how do I make this a balanced reaction? Two in front of the BR. That's perfect. So we don't want to put, we don't, so like common mistake. So no, that's supposed to say T. So not correct right here is to write BR2 because we see that element like that, but it isn't an element. If it were an element, it couldn't be bonded to the iron. It has to be an ion. So we want to make sure that we're writing it as an ion, which means the subscript over here becomes the coefficient. Okay. So we would have iron two plus, and these are aqueous. I don't know if it asks for that, but they are. Ions have to be aqueous. They can't exist in nature by themselves. Okay, they have to be surrounded by water. Um, so we would put in Fe2 plus, we would put in Br minus one. We would also want to put in water, right? Because sometimes, I mean, that's your solvent. So the water is there. Those are the major species. All right, how about the next one? What kind of compound is glycerol? Here's the formula. Glycerol is used in making soap, by the way. Covalent. It is. So if it's covalent, then I don't know if I can fit it. Oh, I did. Good. So we said that's kind of like our example of sugar, where it dissolves if it's soluble which glycerol is. I would not expect you to memorize that. We haven't done organic chemistry, so you don't know that yet, but you can assume it from the problem. But it doesn't actually matter too much whether you say solid or aqueous because they're both in there, right? So your major species are gonna be just glycerol the way that it is. The reason we know it's covalent is because these are all non-metals, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So covalent. Um, so you're going to write that, and you're going to write water, because water is there as well. All right, sodium hydroxide, what kind of compound is that? It is ionic, and it is also one other thing. I'm going to give you a hint. Yeah. Thank you. It's a base. It's a base. So when you have a metal with a um, hydroxide group like that, that means it's a base. So that's how you can identify the bases. It's almost always a group one or group two metal. Okay. It's possible to have OHs that are attached to carbon. They are not bases. Those are something different. So you want to look for the hydroxide with a metal and that'll be a base. Okay. So if something is a base, it does the same thing that um, it does the same thing that the ionic stuff does because bases are electrolytes. So regardless of which one you pick there, it's still going to do the same thing. Okay, so if we have sodium hydroxide and we put it in water, what are we going to get? Uh, Na plus, and then plus OH minus. Perfect. So the polyatomic group stays together. The hydroxide stays as a piece, uh, and but the sodium goes off and does its own little thing. Okay. So um, the reason these are called electrolytes, by the way, if you didn't see the video yet, is because they can carry a charge. And it turns out this one is important in carrying the charge in your heart and your muscles like pretty much everything in your body. Um, but yeah, the polyatomics, no matter what it is, in this case, it's a hydroxide group, but any of those polyatomics on the back of the periodic table from the lab are going to stay together as a piece because they're covalent. They don't disconnect from each other. Okay, so we would answer sodium plus Na plus, OH minus, and water are the main components there. Okay, does that help clarify? Does it make sense to you guys? Hopefully. Give me a thumbs up if you're with me. I can't see all of you. Hold on. Now I can. 
Okay, so if you feel a little bit lost by this, maybe then there's a video that's called solubility. Like, I can't remember the exact title. Electrolytes and solubility, maybe something like that. Um, that goes through this with a little bit more um, detail. Okay. So the next um, Alex problem I wanted to look at is. Um, I think we're going to go down here to the bottom one. I, I want you to know, though, that each one of these topics has a video that goes with it, um, except for maybe recognizing common acids and bases. But we did the acids as part of our naming category, so you're really looking for the same ones we were naming. Bases are just what I told you, NaOH, AOH, anything with group one or group two metals and a hydroxide. This one is types of reactions video. I think it's in module two, so it's pretty old. Um, this one is the electrolytes video. That's what we just did. This one has an entire video just about this. Okay. Um, this one also has a video about solubility. I think that one's called like activity series and solubility, but these are the keywords to look for. Uh, same thing, we just talked about that, it's recognizing from naming. These two are really good to each other. This one is in types of reactions as well. Can anybody tell me right off the top of your head, how, what do we know about neutralization reactions? What are they producing? A salt in a water. So by salt, we need we need something that's ionic, and um, it always produces some water. It could be one water if it's a monoprotic acid and a monoprotic base, but it could be more than one water also. So watch out for that. Um, I feel like we talked about the gas evolving reactions, but I also might be mixing up other classes. Did we talk about this one already? Your gases you can evolve are going to be H2, O2, uh, oops, carbon dioxide, uh, sulfur dioxide, or, oh, H2S, that's the other H. Did we talk about this already or no? Because we'll talk about it today if we haven't. Let's do a vote. Okay, so if you go into the participation tab, bottom of the screen, looks like two people. Um, you'll have the yes and no buttons. If this is familiar to you, if those gases I just wrote down are familiar to you, click yes. If not, click no. Half of us aren't at the computer right now. <laughs> it's the participants button down at the bottom. This thing is mostly no, though. All right, so we'll go over that one as well. I didn't want to repeat things that you already understand. It looks like a lot of us already did get it, but. Um, Oh, wait, I clicked on the wrong one. Hold on. Okay, sorry. So, that list I just gave you are the only um, gases that we're going to have produced in this class. And so, um, basically, if, if you have a single. If you have a single replacement reaction, it's going to be either the oxygen or the H2. <clears throat> if we were in the lab, we could test this. You could light them on fire, and H2 burns so fast in a test tube that it, it makes this like really loud cracking noise, like a bark almost, but really loud, like can, can hurt your eardrums kind of thing. Or oxygen burns slower um, and doesn't make the loud sound. So you can actually tell those apart. 
Um, we don't burn them in lab because I don't want to have hearing damage. <laughs> um, if the reaction is a double displacement, then the only way to get bubbles, the only way to see gas is if um, a, well, not the only way, actually, there's two ways. So if it's followed by a decomposition reaction, and the only way to know that is to be on the lookout for what causes that, so I'll show you that in a second, you'll see CO2 or SO2. If, if it's not followed by a decomposition, it's just a double, then you can also get H2S, which is a gas. Super smelly, disgusting. We don't do it in lab because I hate the smell. Okay, uh, so like in this example, what kind of reaction do you think might happen? We have five types of reactions, right? So there's single replacement, double replacement, combustion, combination, and decomposition. Um, for our purposes, the ones in this are probably going to be either single or double. Although combustions also produce CO2 and water vapor. So which one do you think applies here? Is this a single or a double? Oh yeah, so double because we don't have an element here. So let's try it out as a double. What's going to happen is the cations just switch. So somebody give me what, one of the products. What are we going to get? Sure. So the iron is going to leave the carbonate and go over to the chlorine. And um, how did you know that there would be two chlorine there? It's correct, by the way. Uh, we will we will worry about balancing the reaction by adding coefficients in a second. First, we have to predict products. That's the uh, order that I <clears throat> the order of operations I gave you guys. Yeah. So so as it turns out, this carbonate has a minus two charge, which means this iron has to be plus two because there's only one of each thing. The chlorine is always a minus one. So when you put them together. They do have to add up to zero. So that's the first step. Predict the product, make sure your subscripts are balancing out your charge. All right, so we already moved iron over. So what's the other product going to be? Ah, this is not an acid base neutralization in this case, although some double displacements are because I, this is not a base. FeCO3, actually acidic. I uh, didn't expect you guys to know that yet. So we're just going to treat it like a normal double displacement where you swap them. So the H goes to the carbonate exactly, and you get H2CO3. The next step, and when you're figuring out a double displacement, is to put your states. Uh, chlorine is soluble unless it's with silver, mercury, or lead, and iron is neither, none of those, so it'll be soluble. And um, this is an acid, actually. This is, this is called carbonic acid. If you've ever worked in food service, like I have, the, uh, the tanks that you refill are carbonic acid tanks, not the syrups, the, the actual fuzzy stuff, fizzy stuff, right? That's because anytime you make carbonic acid, it has a habit of decomposing. Um, we put two here because H is always plus one, and a carbonate is always a minus two. Um, and then somebody mentioned we need to balance the reaction. That happens by just putting the two here, because I need two hydrogens to connect with this carbonate, and I need two chlorines to connect with the iron. But again, you want to wait to do that balancing until you know what your products are. Otherwise, people have a tendency to um, put the subscripts that don't make sense. Like if this is a plus two, they would just leave it as a Cl, and then you don't have to balance it. So I want to make sure you understand that it goes Subscripts. Well, words were first, but then subscripts, and then coefficients. Like that. Okay. Um, so, 
the thing about carbonic acid, when you buy, um, when you buy it, there's a place on the arterial called Sunset Carbonic. You can go buy a tank of it, whatever you want. Um, of course, there's proper ways to handle compressed gas tanks, so be careful. But anyways, when you make carbonic acid, it makes things, um, then you need to send me an email so that you can get the recording. Um, it makes things fizzy because it will decompose, that's a liquid, into water and CO2, all right? So first we did the double displacement and we balanced that completely. And then we have to remember every time we see carbonic acid, H2CO3, it's gonna have an additional step. If we add these two steps together, your overall reaction looks like this. So you'll see bubbles, quite a lot of bubbles, because carbonic acid was formed and it decomposed to form water and CO2. All right. To get this balanced right, you do have to do the double displacement first and then the decomp. But your overall reaction will just be the last part. Okay, so there's that gas. There's others that you can make. SO2 forms in a similar way, except you're looking for H2SO3, and that will decompose into water and uh, SO2. So it's kind of a similar pattern to the carbonic acid. Um, this one, H2S, is a little bit different, so I want to go over a problem like that. I'm just going to make it up here. Sulfur compounds are universally stinky. If you take GenChem 2, you will get to use some H2S that's generated as an aqueous solution very carefully because the smell is so bad when you make H2S gas that nobody wants to be in the room. Mm, that's actually solid. Um, But in that experiment, if you put in too much HGL, here's what happens, right? So it's going to be another double displacement again. So we're going to switch. Um, we're going to switch our cations. So H is plus one. This iron is plus two because sulfur is a minus two. And so we'll have um, H2S, which you just have to remember is a gas. And you'll also get FeCl2 again. All right, and then we'll also have to have two of those. So this one doesn't have a decomposition reaction. We just have to know that H2S is a gas, okay? But there's only, there's only really a few options. It's either oxygen, hydrogen, uh, dihydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, or sulfur dioxide. Those are the only sources of gases in these reactions. Okay, so be on the lookout for them. And make sure you put down gas instead of solid or aqueous. Okay, so maybe that maybe that helps. I hope maybe. All right, so I want to do a quick foray into this week's homework. This is another picture representation about molecules. Um, so this is kind of hard to see, but, um, there's two red ones here. These are both oxygen. You can't write small enough to fit it in. Same thing here. Two of those oxygen, same thing here. So there's two, they're connected to each other. So they're, you know, O2. And then we have a bunch of these green ones. These green ones are chlorine. And teeny tiny little hydrogen. Hydrogens are small, so that's why it's shown to scale. And then we have this reaction here. All right. And so the way to approach this is to just count the total number of oxygens. How many oxygen molecules do we have?
So I'm going to set three. So we have three molecules of O2. And I want to figure out how many, um, based on the balanced reaction, I want to figure out how many oxygens are needed to react with each HCl. So I'm going to use the, the what we call the molar ratio. Right. So the molar ratio comes from the balanced reaction, and it's just these coefficients, right? So there's a one oxygen, and there are four HCl. Well, I'll put moles. We could actually even keep it simple and put molecules just to keep it clear. Remember that you can use those balanced coefficients in either fashion, as molecules or as moles. Um, okay, so this would cancel molecules of O2 and get it into molecules of HCl. So I need to have 12 molecules of HCl in order to do this reaction. So the question is, do we have 12? And so I'm going to erase this extra stuff, and we're just going to count. So we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So do I have enough HCl to react with all the O2 that's there? No, you guys are right. We don't. We needed 12. I have, I already forgot. I have eight. I have eight. So like another kind of related question, right? So the, this is kind of trying to walk you through the logic here, right? Which one is the most initial moles? Well, obviously there's more um, HCl than there is O2. So you would put that. Um, the least would be O2. But when you do your conversions, Surprisingly, the thing that is the lowest is what gets consumed entirely, okay? So, um, or I'm sorry, I got that backwards. The things that we don't have enough HCl, it all, that means all the HCl gets used up, right? So if I wanted to figure out how many molecules of O2 actually react, we would start from the HCl because that's what runs out. Recall the thing that runs out, our limiting reactant. Okay, so the example I use is Xbox controllers and electronauts. If, that, if that's ringing the bell at all. The molar ratio is the same, but I gotta flip it because I want to get to O2 and I wanna cancel the HCl this time. So we find out 8 divided by 4 is 2 molecules of O2 are going to be consumed. So in the end, at the end, we would end up with 1 O2. And how many water would we get? I got 1 O2 because we had 3 in the beginning, and I reacted to them, so I got 1 left. Apply the same idea, use your mole ratio, but this time look at HCl to water. How many waters do we produce? Yeah. Maybe. Is that where, the did you, where did you get the eight molecules from? We counted them. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. The three, I'm gonna just make sure I counted right. I did. Okay, good. Okay. You're nervous. So I was like, I just missed that part. Okay. Yeah. So when we look at this particle level picture, we're talking about individual molecules. We can just count them. In other kinds of problems, you'll have to calculate it in moles. But here we just counted. So how many? Oh, we got two guesses. Two or four? You guys all think. No, we already know there's 102 left over. We got that guy. I asked how many molecules of water are going to also be there? Because if this reaction occurs, which we just figured out it would, 
then we, we can use the same theory that we used up here for comparing HCl and O2 to compare HCl and H2O. So we're starting with the limiting reactant. And the only thing that's going to be different is the ratio. Instead of using one molecule of O2 for four molecules of HCl, we'll keep the four HCl, but now we're going to compare with water. So we'll put two of those on the top, right? So eight times two is 16 divided by four. You get to make 16 molecules of water. These are all molecules. Okay, so again, same idea. Try it out. You should probably actually write it down. But tell me, how much Cl2 are we going to make? Anyone got an answer yet? How much CL2 can we make? Jeter, I think you might be the only one paying attention to what I'm saying. Maybe. Mm -hmm. So he caught me. I was trying to see if you guys are paying attention. And there are four Cl2s and four waters, right? 16 comes from just multiplying the top, but then you got to go 16 divided by four, which I did say verbally, but then I wrote 16 just to see what you would do. Yeah, I was getting confused because you wrote 16, but I heard four. Yeah. I'm going to give you an extra credit point. I like, to, I like to make mistakes intentionally and see if anyone's brave enough confident enough in their knowledge to speak up um so yeah <laughs> if that's what you guys were stuck on and you didn't want to type it in that's okay but you can also send me a private message just to me by clicking on the two and then select my name um then you don't have to worry about what other people see if that's the concern okay so this is this is using the molar ratio which you can use if you have a number of molecules or you can use it in the same fashion if you have a number of moles. It applies to both places. Our final total here at the end, all the HCl is gone, by the way. That was our limiting reactant, so it reacts. So we have 102, 4 H2O, and 4 Cl2s, and that's what the picture would look like at the end if we were going to do it. Okay. So you guys are going to have a chance this week, before Wednesday anyways, to practice more of those kind of problems, but it's a matter of looking at the picture and literally just counting it and then applying the mole ratios from the balanced reaction. So you can imagine in the future, we're probably going to give you problems where you also have to balance the reaction at the same time. So these all stack kind of on top of each other. Okay. Um, that does give us the next, you have like 72% of you are ready for this, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump into it. Um, this is a topic, again, that you're learning this week. And so in our last 10 minutes, we'll see how far we can get through this. Theoretical yield is kind of like what we just calculated for the water and the Cl2. It's, it's how many molecules can you make 
given how much uh, limiting reactant you have. So, um, so we have, you know, A reacts with B to form C. What kind of pro what kind of uh, process is that? What kind of reaction do we call that? Yep, exactly, exactly. Combination reaction. Fun thing if you're on the internet, some of you have emailed me a question about this. These are sometimes called combinations, sometimes called a synthesis reaction. And if they're feeling super fancy, they'll call it a metathesis, which means synthesis, but with Latin applied to it, which is already Latin, but anyways, whatever. So they do have different names if you're about looking at videos on the internet. I know why you'd be confused. They're all the same thing. I think there's one more, but I can't remember. The, but these three definitely come up much. And you can tell that it is because you start out with multiple things and end up with one. Um, so we have seven grams of A, and we have excess. Chemists abbreviate this very cleverly. <laughs> we have extra compound B, so excess B. And we end up with 5.2 grams of C. Okay. So this number here is actually measured in the lab, so we'll call that the actual yield. It's the thing you actually, you know, collected. Your theoretical yield comes from knowing which reactant is limiting. If one of them is listed in excess, then the other one must be limiting. So what's our limiting reactant? It's not a trick this time. I'll repeat it once more. So if one of them is listed in excess, that cannot be limiting. So the other one has to be what we run out of, right? So we're going to start with what the limiting reactant is. Sometimes they'll tell you because they'll tell you which one's excess. Sometimes they don't tell you and you have to compute how much product can be made with both A and B and look for which one is smaller. All right. Um, We need these to actually be chemicals. So when you, has anybody done this? Does it have A and B or it has actual chemicals listed on there because you guys are students and I'm not? It says A and B. Mm, okay, that's because they want us to avoid using molecular weights, which is, I was gonna show you how to do this the same way you do them lab, the real way. They're trying to ask us to do a math problem, so we'll just do it that way. Um, so I was hoping these were just placeholders where the computer substitutes in different chemicals, but that's okay. So we know the percent yield, right? And the, the formula for percent yield, it's pretty straightforward. It's the actual amount divided by the theoretical yield times 100%. Okay, and so by actual, what I mean is, you're going to have grams from the lab, and you're going to have grams from calculating it, um, and then you just make a ratio and multiply by 100%. Okay, so in this problem, we know the 40%. Why did they put a decimal place there again? They want to show that this zero is significant. So we put a decimal place there. Yeah, exactly. So we know that there's two sig figs. And we also have two sig figs from our mass um, that we measured in the lab, right? And so when they say that it was isolated, that means how much you measured in the lab. So it's 5.2 grams there. We're trying to calculate theoretical yield. And so we'll just do 
40 divided by 100, part 4 all. Right? And so how do we solve for something that's in a denominator? What do we have to do to this? We're going to get it out of the denominator by multiplying. Okay? And you guys, if you want to, you can put an x here. It doesn't matter. We're going to multiply on both sides. So it ends up being the theoretical yield that we're looking for times 0.40 equals 5.2 grams. Now how do you solve it? I hope we just feel sure. Divide. Short. Oh, perfect. Thank you. So 5.2 divided by 0.4. Don't do it backwards or you get a weird number that doesn't make sense because it'll be lower than the actual yield. Um, so we got 13 grams is the theoretical yield, right? I do examples in the video um, that look more like how we set this up in lab, where you know the actual, you know how much reactants you put in, and you can figure out the theoretical yourself, then calculate the percentage. So, but this is good practice for, you know, for, for conceptual learning here. Okay. By the way, just, you know, like this is going to be relevant when you guys write up your alum lab report, you're doing your first percent yield calculation for alum. Is 40% yield really great? Throw yourself a party. Yeah, you did great. Is that good? What do you think? No, we got one vote for no. That's like getting 40% on a test, right? So 40%, um, you want your goal to be 100%, ideally, in a perfect world. Um, in practice, for Gen Chem 1, the first time you've ever done a percent yield, I would say it's just like your grades. If you get like a 70 and above, it's probably pretty good. Okay. What kind of things might contribute to losing so much of the product? There's a fruit fly in that case. Hate that. Think about the trace contamination experiment. That's where a lot of these errors come from. So transfer loss is a big one. If you had to go between like one container and another while you were reacting it, or if you have to go um, filtering is a, a really big source of transfer loss as well. Spilling definitely could be a problem. You should know that though, so that it's um, something like if I did spill something when I was filtering or you know pouring things together, then I would write that in the procedure section of my lab report. So instead of saying as per directions, I would say as per directions, except I spilled some when I was doing blah, blah, blah. blah. Don't say I, I'm wrong. Avoid the pronouns. Um, Contamination is a different problem. So usually the main source of contamination in the alum experiment is actually water that didn't completely get um, sucked through the filter. So if I have a whole bunch of water hanging out with my crystals, am I likely to have a 40% um, yield or am I likely to have like a 120% yield? Which one makes sense to you? Yeah, it's going to be over 100. Yeah. So those are the, that's the two essential, that, that sums up a lot of the error you're going to find in your alum experiment, which you'll discuss in your conclusion. Um, if it's below 100%, you want to really focus on things like transfer loss and um, the precision of your glassware could be another issue there. That could make it go high or low. It's not systematic. Could be random like that but you also want to think about things like um did you tear did you weigh your aluminum accurately that's your limiting reagent so the weight of that determines your percent yield right and if you weigh that in incorrectly then it could be too high or it could be too low um if you end up with like ten thousand percent yield or really low like 20 percent or less you probably have a calculation mistake and you need to, to go talk to me or your lab professor 
show us your work, and we can figure out where you're stuck. Um, but contamination is mostly water, and that would happen if you have a higher than 100% yield. And that's if you don't have higher than 100% yield, don't say contamination. You don't have evidence for that. Okay. If you have lower than 100% yield, um, you're going to look at mostly transfer loss. Oh, and the other source of contamination, too, is you guys put the seed crystals in there. So if you dump a whole bunch of seed crystals in there, it's going to be way over 100% because you added mass to the system. Right? Okay. So those are important things to think about when you're writing your lab report in the near future. Okay, anyone have questions? <laughs>